Welcome, Donald. We're here to do the inaugural video in my new series, A Chat with Authors, about their books and or articles regarding anything performance-based instruction-wise and performance improvement beyond instruction. Today, we're here to talk about your new book, Artificial Intelligence for Learning, and to talk more broadly about AI in both instructional development and in instructional deployment and access. To start, can you give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and your new book, and uh, including you know, who you wrote it for and what are some of the key points before we launch into the series of questions that I have for you? Sure, Guy. Yeah, thanks for inviting me uh, uh, today. The, I think let me give you a little story then and how I got to the AI thing. Very short, really. So I, I came into this industry in 1983, which is a long time ago. So I keep meeting people I've met who were born after that date. So a few of us are veterans of the technology and learning business. And uh, that was 1983. And in, interestingly, that was on the back. I'd, I had I have a degree in philosophy, but I, I was lucky enough to study at Dartmouth College in the US. And Dartmouth, not many people know, was the, was the home of the modern era of AI. So in 1956, a very famous AI conference took there, run by a guy called John McCarthy. And uh, he invented the phrase artificial intelligence, in fact. So I, that, that was my first encounter with artificial intelligence, actually, before I started in technology-based learning. And then I ran, a, I founded and, and ran a, a quite a large online learning company, well, it was on CD-ROMs and all sorts of things before that, floated that in the stock market, sold that in 2005. And then more recently, you know, I was investing in other tech companies and so on. And then the more I read, the more I realized that there was one huge thing looming captured by these two letters, AI. And that is that it's the underlying technology of the modern age. This is the age of algorithms. This is the age of AI. Nothing happens online now without it being mediated by, by AI. Except in learning, that was the puzzle. So in the learning era, we were sort of stuck in a flat HTML, you know, almost old client server model of the 1990s that I remember well. And that's not so bad, that's the technology we had, but boy, is it time to move on. The, the wonders that AI offers us in terms of analysis at the front end, a subject close to your heart, uh, Guy, as well as back end, uh, space practice, performance, the implementation of this stuff. AI is handing us this on a plate, and yet we're still stuck plowing the old furrow of chunks of video and content and so on in the middle. So. Wait, why did I write the book? So I, and, and AI, had, you know, I had some time designing intelligent tutoring programs in the 1990s, which were the early versions of AI. And then more recently, I set up an AI company. I built something that allowed you to create content using AI. I'm a director of an LXP company, which has a big learning record store product there. You know, so I'm, my whole life now is completely in the middle of this world of AI and learning, because I think it offers the most hope in terms of the technology. And let me, pre let me put a little caveat on that. I think it's the technology that offers most to the learning arena. I'm, I'm big on learning theory. You know, I spend most of my time reading and writing about learning theory. But AI is the one bit of technology that allows you to do most of the good things that learning theory takes place. Flat content isn't. <laughs> so if you do want to personalize or get cognitive effort and engagement and all those 101 other things that the theory says are good, Forget that old technology. It doesn't do that. It's mostly passive. You're mostly watching, thinly scattered with multiple choice questions. That's the old world. The new world is the world of AI. It's the world of Google, social media, all those things that are mediated by AI. So that's why I wrote the book. And the book was written uh, with a very practical goal, which is all those people who work in my field, you know, my people, uh, all those instructional interactive designers, learning experience designers, analysts, managers, supervisors, business people, the people in charge of learning, HR, L&D, all those people are struggling with AI because it seems complicated, but it's not really. It's just another bit of tech. So the book, uh, you know, AI for Learning, was written for those folks, my folks, your folks, uh, to give them a a door into this world. So I went through the whole learning journey, really from, you know, so how do you get learners on board, learning engagement, the upfront stuff, uh, through to learner support. How can we actually get good feedback, good, you know, those good things that we know will work in terms of learning? How do we get maybe much cheaper content production even, you know, are we really going to pay $20,000 per hour of learning forever? 
and get a whole load of video and stuff back? Or are we going to have smarter, cheaper stuff that can be done in a day? You know, that's what I was hoping for and I've achieved, I think. And then right through to assessment and all that far end stuff. And then beyond that into practice, the transfer of learning, performance, learning in the workflow, all that sort of stuff that AI gives us. In fact, I think it's the only way you could do this. All that's there. But of course, technology is always ahead of sociology. You know, that's a fact. It's always ahead. Yeah. And sociology is always ahead of pedagogy. You know, so we're always in a catch up mode, but that's okay. You know, that's just this realism. To be realistic, that's true. But uh, I think we're at the time now. Why now? AI is everywhere. You can't open a newspaper. You can't read anything online without seeing those two letters. It's about time we took it seriously in the learning world. So the book was written as a door opener in that sense. And I noticed uh, in my reading of it that you basically you're a you're addressing the promise of AI in the educational realm, as well as in what I might call corporate or enterprise learning. Well, that's right. I think, you know, what people, you know, this idea that they are two completely separate world, it was a Venn diagram, they're two completely separate, it's just nonsense. I mean, you know, we, we, we have one learning brain. That's the common denominator is people with one single brain. The brain doesn't distinguish between learning and education. Uh, so the cognitive science, the core cognitive science is all about basic learning. And it, it tells us loads of things, but it tells us that less is more. It tells us that you don't learn a damn thing without practice. Uh, you tend to forget everything, so on and so forth. All that's common ground to both. Yeah. So the book was written with both in mind, that's right. Well, let's, let's then uh, shift gears here a little bit and let's talk about the promise or the hope of AI in learning regarding uh, various aspects of, uh, first we'll talk about instructional development and then we'll talk about instructional access and deployment. So the, uh, the push of, ins, uh, of uh, instruction and pull of instruction in terms of that last part, access and deployment. But uh, let's start with, uh, where do you see as the promise or hope of AI in assisting with project intake and planning in more of an enterprise corporate uh, learning uh, realm? Yeah, well, in, if you're working in, in an organization, then you really do have to sit back and think a bit before you actually start making this stuff. And my fear is that the sort of learning experience design world just rushes towards creating loads of buzzy experiences. Big mistake. Big mistake. Uh, you have to do some analysis up front here. You know, I think we have to be realistic. Everybody else does. If you had a, a million dollars to spend in marketing, you're not just going to rush out with a checkbook, start splashing it, splashing it on ads without thinking about whether it's appropriate or not. The same is true in learning. So I think what it does, because AI is fundamentally data-driven, that's the fuel that gets the rocket going, it forces you to do a little, be a little bit more careful and objective by gathering data at the front end whether that's data about the need itself, whether training is appropriate, whether that's data about the learners, terribly important, are they distributed, are they not, do they have uh, the right kit to be able to handle all this stuff. There's a whole load of analysis that used to be called task analysis, uh, target audience analysis, which was sort of quietly got dropped really, I think, by a lot of people, but has come back to the fore because Actually, what we do now is take that even more seriously by being more objective about the data. And sometimes that means business data. So, hey, presto, every organization in the world is gathering and storing data in reasonable formats that we have access to. So I think the upfront analysis process, in a sense, it's not made easier, but boy, is it better because you've got quality data about the organization before you start. And I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project at the moment, which is the design of a thing called the Blender for blended learning, which actually sucks in data at the front end. Who are your learners? You know, a whole lot of data points about that. What type of learning are you using? You know, so we go back to a basic taxonomy of learning. You know, it's very, you know, it's very, is it psychomotor skills? Is it basic knowledge? Is it, you know, that usual distinctions. And we have not gone back to Bloom, which was 19, you know, 1950s. We, there have been like a dozen taxonomies since. So if we get data on what kind of learning, what kind of learners, what resources do you have in your organization? What are the needs? How can we deliver it? Then you go through quite a smart process, again, using AI to come out with an optimal blend. So I think actually AI could be a real solution to that age old problem of designing an optimal training or non training solution uh, at the front end. Did that make sense? Yes, no, it does. Um, so we have all this data that's available that could help us pinpoint where 
you know, enterprise leaders might want to target because they can see where their current operations are uh, not meeting the needs, um, uh, falling short of their goals. Um, they can look more granularly at where in their processes might they want to focus because they should have business metrics to drive all of that. Yeah. That's what I was hoping that, that beginning to look at that might help us, may help the leaders decide where they want to make investments and sharing that data with their learning and development organizations so that we understand what are the business metrics that we might affect through learning. Um, yeah. or non-learning means, whatever that might be. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so when we get into things like doing task analysis, there, you know, there's this concept, Dr. Richard E. Clark talks about cognitive task analysis, and he's uh, involved in an effort right now to uh, bring AI into cognitive task analysis to reduce the cycle time, reduce the costs of all of this. Um, and it holds promise uh, but he's got a ways to go, he tells me. But uh, so what insights do you have in terms of looking at the performance itself that learning should affect and, uh, you know, de determining what are the enabling knowledge and skills? That's my language for it. But uh, so once we understand performance and the enabling knowledge and skills, we can look for sources of content. But so what? where is AI in that realm from your perspective? Well, a... To be practical for a moment, you know, if, if you want access to business data, forget about the data you may gather for learning purposes, yeah. then lots, lots of businesses have those. In fact, they, the, the bigger the business, the more likely they, they will have a centralized source of that data. So the business data will be stored somewhere and in a reasonable format because they, boy, will they be using it. I mean, speak to somebody who heads up the sales organization of a major global yeah. company. They live and breathe on data. What do you think Salesforce is? It's a, it's a data-driven AI driven product now. So we have to match up to that in a sense. So you, the, the, I think one of the best ways, best things you can do in an organization is find out who owns the business data as an L&D person and see what you can use or how they can help you because they're probably further up the maturity curve than you. In fact, we, I've just been involved in a project that uh, with a company called Learning Pool where we've designed a maturity curve on data. So you just go online. So it's Learning Pool. It's free. You go on and type in a few questions. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. And it will come back with a maturity rating for you and l and on, on data. But I think it's terribly important that you make that effort because if you're designing product knowledge, customer care, sales programs, boy, do you need sales data. <laughs> That's going to be your goal. That's how you're going to be judged. That's the truth. And further down the line, looking at the tail end of the process, uh, if you're looking at actual performance of salespeople, then boy, will you be comparing their performance with actual sales, personal sales. So I think at both ends of the spectrum, if you're dealing with one common data set, you will, you will make progress here. Now, coming back to uh, Richard's task analysis issue here. Now, this depends on the task, of course. So at one end of the spectrum with semantic knowledge, and for example, you can do some amazing things because natural language processing takes huge corpuses of text. So that could be, we take an extreme example, let's say the social text within an organization. And we've been doing this for real. So you can take, let's, well, let's give you a real prosaic example, a really simple example. If you're on Zoom and using chat and there are 20 people in the chat meeting and you capture all that text and store it as text, you can apply sentiment analysis using AI to see what people liked or didn't like or to see what they didn't know. So I was on a, I was on a Zoom uh, keynote talk the other day and it was fascinating watching the chat because I mentioned LXPs at one point and immediately three people went up what is an LXP so I stopped and briefly gave a little well this is what an LXP it's in the learning experience platform it does this very quickly in the flow of the keynote and of course that's the most valuable piece of data for me what those people have just said I don't know what this is but how often do learning people really pay attention to that you know we assume so that people know so much uh, uh and sometimes we, we're, we're building training where people are engaged and that's just, they're only engaged because they're covering stuff they already know. <laughs> it's really yeah. easy to click through stuff you know. So much of that isn't, so much of our analysis misses the fact that we should be looking for what people don't know, not just covering the stuff that they already do know. This is really common in compliance training, for example. So I think sentiment analysis can be applied to do analysis on anything where people speak or 
type or there's text available. Performance analysis is a bit tricky, but even there, uh, for example, uh, two years ago, I was quite heavily involved in VR training, you know, yeah. and I had all the development kit, got to know quite a lot about that. But that's an astonishing thing as well. So I play tennis, you know, and uh, boy, do I wish that uh, I had learned tennis in the days of artificial intelligence, where I can have a couple of sensors on my wrist and upper torso, and it will within an hour, I will double the speed of my serve, <laughs> because it, the data is telling me what I'm doing wrong. I'm actually focusing on my arm and not upper body twist, all the usual stuff. Now, I could pay, you know, $100 an hour for a coach, or I could do it really cheaply using a $100 headset. So I think we're coming into the age where, you know, whether it's psychomotor stuff or the middle ground of skills, our knowledge-based stuff can all be, in a sense, subject to the analysis by very smart software. We're seeing this happen now. Once we have uh, the analysis data and we understand performance and the knowledge and skills and what people know or don't know, yeah. how, how might AI affect the actual design before people launch into development? You know, I think the design is one of these lost skills too, like analysis. You know, people just jump in to start developing content. Um, but yeah. how, you know, how into or organizing, sorting, sequencing, modularizing content, what what can AI do for us now or in the near term? Well, that's the area I've been, I think that's the area where we can have the big short-term win because e-learning content, that's the business I've been in for a long time. And I made a lot of money in that business, but I feel guilty about it in a way, you know, the charging people $20,000 or pounds sterling an hour for content. Wow. You know, and we're still in that world, but I think, Every, if we go back to what is an organization, what does it have? Well, it has a mother load of documents. I haven't yet to come across a large organization that doesn't have this huge dungeon of documentation. Now, usually online because it's digitized. It has a, a mother load of PowerPoints produced by subject matter experts. And technical companies is really common. You know, the 120 slide deck. Uh, absolutely hopeless for training. Absolutely the norm. Let's not pretend this doesn't exist. It's everywhere. Or now increasingly you have some videos. Uh, okay, so you've got these mother loads of content. How do you get that into the heads of learners? Well, this is where AI can really help. And so we built a system called Wildfire that basically you just send me a PowerPoint, a document or a video, and the AI will take the text file. So in a PowerPoint, there will be text on the screen or in the notes. In a document, of course, there will be text. There will be graphics with annotated text uh, beneath them. And of course, in video, you have the narration of the video. We grab those and then we use AI to do a thing called entity analysis. So you look at it and it goes, what are the main learning points here? You know, if, let's take a medical paper. Now, no doctor or senior physician ever memorizes a whole medical paper. What they do is memorize the author, the date of publication, what were the goals? Was it about safety or efficacy? How many people were in the trial? What were the side effects and conclusions? There are about 10 things you might need to know from a medical paper. So what we do is use the AI to suck out those 10 things Okay, and then it will apply good learning theory. And I like retrieval practice. I like effortful cognitive stuff, you know, where you're doing things, not multiple choice questions. And it will say, right, what was the name of the author of the paper? You have to type it in, you know, you have to know it, pull it out of the back of your brain. Uh, or what was the dose? What's the recommended dose of this drug? What were the two side effects? How many people? What was the gender split? It will ask you those questions. Now, in terms of content production, it's not just a sort of fill in the blank type thing, although that's pretty useful. People, you know, the fill in the blank technique on the original documents is really useful in technical training because lawyers are used to legal documents. Doctors are used to clinical guidelines. Why we have to repackage everything and start from a blank slate and rebuild everything from scratch is sometimes beyond me. Doctors, physicians are smart people. They can read clinical guidelines. So take that original content and then meld it with good learning theory. So tooling, you know, unbelievably, died recently, unfortunately. Unbelievable psychologists recognize that memory works on cues. So you don't remember a whole memory, uh, you don't remember a whole medical paper, but you will remember that one word, the name of the author. You will remember the aims of the paper, the conclusion, the couple of side effects. And those are cues, they're like the handles on suitcases in your brain. You pull out the name of the guy, who, woman who wrote the paper, and the, the rest follows the contents of the suitcase full. That's how memory works. So keyword 
you know, typing in the dose, you know, the actual 10 milligram dose thing, that really does matter. But we've gone one stage further because most teaching is not like e-learning. Most teaching is asking a question and then the user gives an answer back. And then you adjust and give feedback until somebody knows something. Now, AI can interpret open answers, you know? So if, if, I, if I did say, you know, uh, you know when, did, when, did, when did Scotland merge with England historically? And you go, oh, God, that's a good question. I have no idea. Well, fair enough. No idea. Type in no idea. I'll come back and say, well, there were two major stages of this. One was the Union of the Crowns. The other was the Union of the Parliament. Have you got any idea when the Union of the Crowns take place? You go, well, was it, was it the 17th century? Yeah, 1603, you type in, you know? And then we, we move forward. So I can interpret full sentences and paragraphs that you type in or speak in a turn of the text. And we've been using AI to do semantic analysis on real answers by real learners. Boy, that's what teachers have been doing for thousands of years. <laughs> and yet, so, but we're stuck in the multiple choice question mode, you know? So when did Scotland's Union of Crowns take place? A, 1603, B, 1605. What, really? <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of usually making an educated guess on it because the answer's on the screen somewhere. I'm not having to make a lot of effort here. I've got a 25% chance of getting it right by guessing anyway. So I think moving on with that sort of retrieval practice and application, you know, deliberate practice, making it more difficult as you go through on a gradient. We know a lot about how useful that is. Spaced practice, we'll come to that no doubt further on. But all of those things means that content creation could be done really quickly. We produce courses the same day, you know. You send me a really good document. We did one for, you know, people who installed gas boilers in your house the other days. A really basic thing, but everybody has one, you know. And the, the standards people just sent me the document, you know, and we, we had it out by the next day, you know, this is the stuff you so, need. So to. how do you do branching on the front end to determine, you know, what guy knows already or doesn't know so that you can guide me more effectively, efficiently through the content when I may know some things, you know, so like yeah. a test or whatever. Does, well, does, does your system do that? I would imagine that in the, you know, if it doesn't, then in the long term, it, it probably will be able to do okay. so. Okay, yeah. Well, there are, so there are many types of AI learning systems. The, the welfare system is much simpler than that because you're just typing in stuff. If you know it, there's no harm actually in sometimes reinforcing what you already know as well. Sometimes, right, as you know, right. as you know, in terms of just deeply embedding it again. And then it acts as a structure for the stuff you don't know anyway, so you can wed it in. Mm -hmm. But so that's what we, there's no branching in that sense at the front end on the wildfire system. Although we do have quite a sophisticated system whereby if you're typing stuff in and you don't know the name of something, like in a medical program, you it's asking you for the word like hypertrophy. And you go, God, you know, I don't know what that actually means. This is really common in medical training. Physicians have a high end vocabulary, nurses and medical, middle medical professions don't. But the AI auto automatically produces little links and you can just click on the link and it goes to the page on hypertrophy and just explains it briefly. And then you go back and carry on learning. Mm -hmm. So the AI curates content in real time as you go. But in answer to your question around personalization, I was, okay, you guy knows different things from me, Donald. Adaptive learning systems, another species of AI, are a bit like having a sat nav or GPS hanging off the side of your, you know, in your car. If you get lost when you're driving from New York to Washington, you go off piste, uh, the sat nav gets you back on course and you get to Washington. Uh, or New York. So they, that, that's what the adaptive learning systems do. They use AI like an intelligent tutor and you vector through the content as an individual uh, going fast if you know the stuff. So if you know the stuff, it, it gets to know that you know the stuff and it will accelerate you. So if you're doing a math program and you basically, you know, you know quadratic functions, then it'll, it'll spirit you on past that very quickly. But if you don't know quadratic functions, boy, will it keep you there until you do know them. Because in maths, it's catastrophic if you try and leap forward. You just get nowhere. It's a very structured domain. And what the reason most people fail miserably, catastrophically at school, is the course moves on, but you don't. You've got stuck somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. Every, I, almost everybody's hand goes up at that one yeah. because it's not that people are bad at maths. It's just that the one size fits all structured course in maths dooms the majority to failure because it's a tough subject, tough to teach, tough to learn. So we've, I've been involved over the last four or five years with a, a system called Cogbooks, an adaptive learning platform, big trials in a Arizona State University on biology, maths, physics, psychology, statistics. 
amazing dog legs and performance by students. These are 101 courses. Mm -hmm. You know those courses that are really tricky, your first course at college, yeah. but if you don't pass it, you're in trouble. Because actually, if you don't know that stats, you're not going to get a degree in biology or psychology. So we've had dog leg upwards on attainment, less dropout. And of course, they, these are scalable systems. You can go and buy an adaptive learning course right now off the shelf, and I can guarantee you'll get increased, increased student attainment. Well, you, you talked about that uh, that instance at Arizona State, was it in your book? I do. Um, but but so my question is: so do so to personalize it? Is AI able to chunk out that content to decide what the branching might be, or does a human need to intervene still today in determining what that might be and be assisted by AI? But you know, so can this happen? You know, sans human. Yeah. So AI can summarize. So typically, you know, you've said, we've all seen those 20, 50,000 documents, 120 slides, that sort of stuff. Training departments get that all the time and our heart sinks when we get one. <laughs> now, AI, AI is particularly good at summarization. So there's extractive and abstractive. There are two forms of summarizing. So you give me a big document. I can shrink it down to whatever size I say. I want it one page of A4 or two. Uh, so the, the, the extractive keeps all the sentences intact, but just picks out the most important ones. Okay, abstractive sort of praises the document in new language. So AI is pretty good at this. You know, there are services that allow you to do this. And I think training departments should use this more often. But in practice, you know, something very interesting here. In, in large companies, people are quite good at this. When they produce documents, they produce a chap, they're normally chapterized paragraphs, sections, good headings. You know, people are really quite good at this in large organizations. And often they'll have an abstract at the front of each chapter with a yeah. summary or a summary at the end. So more often than not, it's already there. And we don't, we don't do the abstractive or extractive summarization. We actually just pluck out the summaries because the summaries are usually the need to know knowledge. And I was, what does a person really need to know here? Well, they're not going to remember the whole chapter of some huge report, but they are maybe going to remember four or five things from that chapter that really matter to them. <laughs> so sometimes all you need to do is just cut and paste out the abstracts, you know? It's like the medical paper thing. Actually, for most medical papers that are published in the Lancet or whatever, the abstract is all you need because that's mm -hmm. the essence of the paper. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just the man some manual good sense at the front end, good old fashioned analysis at the front end does, you, does a good job anyway. Well, thank you. So, so it'll help me with the design and development and chunking and figuring out, uh, you know, a, a logical sequence of when one is demanded or allow people to wander and do whatever they want for a second and third. Yeah. Uh, but uh, then what can AI do? <coughs> what I would call pilot testing, you know, the trying to really determine, does this really have what people need in order to be able to perform? Yeah. If learning is a means to performance. So, so what, what you see available from AI now or, or in the near term for helping us to really put the learning content to the test to determine, is it really you know, uh, uh, accurate, complete, and appropriate given the, what the performer, what the learner needs to be able to go do? Yeah, well, one of the great things about this AI super fast, you know, the thing about AI is I often quote this as an example, and uh, uh, and it's in the book of the Georgia Tech teaching assistant, you know, which was a chatbot. Yeah. And all these students loved it because, you know, they asked a question about their assignment, and they were AI students, smart kids. And it would come back immediately with an answer. You go, wow, you know, I don't know who this teaching assistant is, but they're fantastic. And they were fooled that it was, they yeah. it was a real well, they didn't. Yeah, they, 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 one, one of them sort of caught it. Well, the reason they, they were all fooled, apart from one kid who went, hold on, that was that 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 faculty, that teaching assistant came back faster than that could have been typed. And he, he put a little bit skeptical question in. And of course, what they did is slow down. So they put a deliberate delay in, <laughs> yeah. it was like, which is amusing. But the interesting thing about the, that example is how how quick this stuff can be you know mm -hmm. so, so this morning literally this morning i had a client on zoom just like this and it was a, a major global law firm and in the 15 minutes before i came on the zoom call 
I did. I took the two paragraphs from their Wikipedia site. I put it into the AI tool, and it produced a course. And we sat there and we did the course, and it was a bit fun, you know, because it had when they merged with the previous firm. Uh, when did you move into Russia? It had the day, and I was, and they, we had some fun because they worked in the law firm, you know, so they should know this stuff. And of course, it caught them out in a couple of things. And uh, that's a, the great thing about prototyping is. Unfortunately, if you're using most of the older tools in e-learning for producing this stuff, you know, there's four weeks where we get the documentation, another couple of weeks on a script. We'll then show you a rough wireframe and a prototype. I'm, I did that in five minutes. <laughs> you know, I just poured the text in because the AI did all the design. Also, it produced links out. So that there were three, there are three big companies that merged together to form a global company. Okay. And it had links out to the three companies you know, information about three companies before they merged. And that was quite useful if you were learning about the history of that company, you know, for onboarding. Mm -hmm. uh, it had the total number of employees they had, the total number of employees they now have, what countries they were in. You know, this typical stuff you would have in onboarding. What's the name of the chief exec, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and but it was quick. And traditional methods, non-AI production methods take, I mean, to be fair, it takes weeks, you know, to get this stuff. Certainly. And of course, the great thing is, the, I, I did a really marvelous project where I produced a, this was for a big European travel company who sell cruises, holidays. Unfortunately, of course, that's all gone at the moment. Yeah. But they trained a huge number of their staff on geography. You may have said that's odd, but to, in order to sell a cruise to people like you and me, Guy, who, you know, the typical buyers of, of cruise cruises, you need to know the geography. Where is it? Okay, the, on a Mediterranean cruise, you're going to stop at Genoa, you're going to stop at Naples, you're going to go around to Athens. Well, what do you do when you get off the boat? You're going to have to know that stuff to sell it. And we gave them this amazing program that was produced 50 hours of global stuff, you know, what currency you use and so on, so that when you were selling it, you really had, you know, if you stopped in Naples, you would know from your brain, because you'd learned it, that Vesuvius, pizza, Herculaneum, that's Pompeii, that's what you're going to see when you come off the boat, you know? And it was great, you know? <laughs> so I think what we did there is we had not one face-to-face -face meeting. We prototyped using their branding very quickly, first on a Zoom call, sharing it on the screen. It is online learning. Then we went on to do all the testing online, you know, and I would say, if you wanted it change. And the AI, interestingly, picked up on some of the mistakes on the original content. So the original, this is a really interesting example. So subject, you might think subject matter experts are infallible, but boy, are they, <laughs> you know, if you've been around in training for a while, you know how untrue that is. So we, we got given documentation about the countries of the world. And one of them was about Europe and Southern Ireland. It called Southern Ireland, Southern Ireland. Now, if you mention that to somebody from ERA or Southern Ireland, they go apeshit. It's not Southern Ireland, <laughs> you know, it's Ireland or it's ERA. And so the AI caught this because the AI went out into the web and looked at the Wikipedia page and went, there is no Southern Ireland Wikipedia page. It's actually called Ireland or Southern or ERA. And it, it flagged it. So sometimes the AI can be smarter than humans in terms of accuracy checks. So when we're doing, a, when we're looking at a big document, we, we use that trick. So we go out to Wikipedia and say, is there a big page on this? If there is in medical terms, it's going to be quite important. You know, if there isn't, it's probably not going to be that important. So there's all sorts of tricks the AI can play on the corpus of data around the design process. So I've just given you a feel for some of the wonderful and amazing things that AI can bring to the table here that we didn't have even just a few years ago. Thank you. So, so that we've kind of covered, you know, creating content and making so that it is available to be either pushed out, deployed some way, or just hold access by people who need it. Yeah. What kind of AI systems might help somebody to, you know, uh, to a manager and or an employee determining, you know, what does guy need for his job out of all the content that's available all throughout the whole internet, you know, so we can yeah. use things that are come from our company, but there may be things from outside our company's walls that we need to access and determine, you know, a, tr a, a development plan for guy. What's yeah. out there now? What, what is okay, well, this is where the traditional LMS world failed us, but I don't want to be too critical of the LMS world because it, it was what we had, you know? It was the old model, and it does a job, and it does it well. Yeah, I, I can't criticize it for not doing what it wasn't designed to do, but the world has moved on, and, of course, the, 
it's moved on because LMS functionality is having now to become LXP or learning experience platforms, which are much more sensitive to the issues that I know you care about. But, you know, it's not, it's not just about engagement here. You know, you, I, I often say this, you know, I go to the Edinburgh Festival every year or did, <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of hours of stand-up comedy, stand-up comedians. Can't remember a damn joke. I was massively engaged every time, spent a fortune on it, can't remember a damn thing. Engagement is not the key word here. It's really what results in, you know, through practice and then ultimately transfer and application in the real world. That's what organizational learning is about. But the LXP systems are helping us here. And even in the web, you can go, I often direct people to Duolingo, you know, learning a second language is the hardest thing you'll ever do as an adult learner in your life. It's a never ending task. You never ever get there. <laughs> But Duolingo does a passable job on basic vocabulary and grammar. You eventually need some immersion. But what it does is embody good practice through AI. So it has space practice built in. So if you're learning, so I, uh, you know, I've been, I was learning Russian and uh, if I went away for a week on, holiday, on vacation somewhere, it knew I'd gone away for a week. And when I come back, it takes me back down the skills ladder because it knows with absolute certainty that I've forgotten stuff. Well, hey, that's science. We know that's true. How often does that happen in training programs? We recognize mm -hmm. that. Never, never in my experience. So moving forward through the LXP thing will know you as a, an employee of the company. It will know that your guy will know your job. It may even know what courses you've been on before, what your educational background is, dispositions, all sorts of things. That then allows recommendation engines out the data to take place. So a little quick thumbnail sketch around the use of data and AI and learning. You have descriptive data. What did Guy do? Well, he clicked on this, he clicked on that, he watched that video. He quite likes those books because he's bought six of them on that topic from Amazon. That's just descriptive data. That's useful, but not enough. The next level is analysis of the data. Okay, well, what about people like Guy, you know, in that similar job? What do they tend to buy as an aggregate group? What's their performance on these courses, blah, blah, blah. So analysis of data, you know, means, averages, all that sort of stuff. But the really spicy stuff is the next two levels, not description or analysis, but prediction. And it was, what is Guy likely to need in a couple of weeks when he's on that massive project in Bahrain? <laughs> you know, what are, the, what are the four or five really important things he needs to know there? Uh, and then pushing and pulling on an LXP system so you get it when you're actually going to apply that knowledge. Or even better, prescription, that's the fourth level. Actually, I'm just going to, I know Guy, I know what he needs, I'm going to give it to him because I know that on the 14th of September, he's going to be doing this and he needs this. Now, that's what Google does. It's what Amazon does. It's what Netflix recommendation engines do. They just automate that decision. They take the pain out of the decision-making for you mm -hmm. and recommend what they think the next box set is you would like to, to watch. Or on Amazon, so you bought my book on Amazon, and it probably it, it, it probably came up by a book by Mildred Nielsen next to it because that's the closest topic, and it's a different topic, but it knows that you like books that are quite analytic on, on, you know, on learning theory, associated with practice and the application. So it's making an educated guess of what you might like to buy next. I think that's smart. I don't see mm -hmm. why people bitch about that. It doesn't make any sense to me why people would complain about something that just tries to help you. You don't have to buy the book. It's just saying, listen, you bought this, you might like that. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. yeah so exactly. I think, I think prescription is how we get space practice and all that stuff. Yeah. It's like Duolingo actually just forces you it does a really smart thing. I'll, I'll finish off with this as a, a almost perfect example. When you learn a language, most people never get anywhere near learning it and they stop. They become demotivated because they don't feel as though they're making progress. Now, the guy behind Duolingo is an AI guy, Lewis. He's a Guatemalan programmer out of Carnegie Mellon. He's the guy who invented CAPTCHA. If you know that little type, he invented that smart guy. And he wanted ed language education to be free because when he went to Carnegie Mellon, he, f he found that almost nobody spoke Spanish, <laughs> which was unusual because there were a lot of Spanish students. So. so he's making this stuff free. But it's the way in which it sends notifications out to you that really amazes me. When you come off the boil, it knows you're coming off the boil and it just nudges you. So it's using behavioral tactics. And the most amazing thing of all, and Lewis talks about it, he said, he has one killer notification and he calls it the guilt no notification. 
if it, if the system spots that you're falling off a cliff, you're going to stop learning Spanish. It sends you this email that basically goes, hold on, you've come this far. Just keep on going. You're nearly there. Keep on going. And it's a wonderful example of how you can embed good pedagogy, behavioral economics into the technology to keep people going because that's half the battle in learning yeah. is what happens after the course. That's where all the action is. How do you practice, transfer, apply things, keep people going, give them hope, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I think that's why AI is such an amazing help for us in the learning field. We focus too much on delivering content, delivering courses, and not enough on what happens afterwards. Yeah. Now, and to be fair, we, we, when they walk out the door of the training room, we don't, we, they're lost, they were lost to us. But now they all have a smartphone in their pocket or, or a laptop, we can get to them. Mm -hmm. And let's get to them in a personal and smart way and learn from what Google, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, Amazon, you know, the 10 most valuable companies on the planet do this. Do we think we have nothing to learn from them? They have billions of people who are engaged, that great word that learning people, far more so than in training programs. We have tons to learn from the way they do things. Uh, I, I thank you so much for, you know, taking, making the effort to write your book. I really enjoyed it. I think I said uh, in my review on Amazon that uh, I have a 12 year old grandson who's uh, fairly computer literate. I wanted him to read this book maybe a little bit early for him, but, but I really want him to have these insights that you shared in the book. But uh, so I hope that uh, our audience here will seriously consider uh, investigating your book finding it some way and uh, consuming it. But can you point us to maybe two or three other resources that you think would be good for people who are trying to climb this learning curve all about artificial intelligence for learning? Who else has got anything, videos or articles or books? Well, I think there are two or three areas. The one thing I would do is just to keep an eye on AI in general, you know, because there's some wonderful things. For, and I find social media extremely useful in this re regard. If you've got some notifications coming in. So yesterday I discovered, now I keep an eye on this stuff, but I missed this. In Beijing today, there are thousands of people taking taxis that are self-driving cars. Now, I had no idea that was true. Now, I know quite a lot about self-driving cars. My, you know, my, my good friend Paul has a Tesla. I know, you know my, my son has a degree in AI. We talk about this all the time. I had no idea that was true. But isn't that an astonishing fact? <laughs> you know, that's mind-blowing almost. You know, it's like pure science fiction. So I think using social media for general AI advances is useful. And I, I like to post loads of that stuff all mm. the time especially if it's uh, related to learning, which I think a lot of it these days uh, is. There are plenty of examples. Let me give you another good example. Uh, I, I tweeted this yesterday, which is Starlink, which is the Elon Musk network of satellites that will mm -hmm. envelop yeah. the whole planet. It's designed, designed to deliver 5G, which is a huge boost to AI and learning. It will, there are no blind spots. It has 99% coverage of the planet. We can get to Africa, all those places where people are desperate for learning. But there are, the first trial was a quite remote group of North American Native Indians who had never had any access to online learning. And during COVID, they were stuck. And Elon Musk's first trial was then. And isn't that a marvelous thing? Even in a very rich country like America, you have poverty. We know this is true. Oh, it's yeah. true in my country as well. And if we can solve some of these social problems... so. Going back to your question, I think just keep an eye on the AI, the wonderful things that are happening in AI and learning, setting up notifications on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, TikTok, whatever you're on. Also keep an eye on those. Have a look at TikTok. Uh, you know, not many people are able to pay attention to it. It's an AI-driven system. You know, It has short 15-second videos where you can double up on them. You can play them at different speeds. And it's full of learning content. You know, If you want to know something really quickly, there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of videos on that basic things on your car or how to change the oil or whatever. You know, they're all done very, very clever indeed. Keep an eye on the newer technology. Coming back to the learning front, I mean, I, I think bloggers, this is not an area with a lot of books yet because it's so new. So I've written this book, you know, there are not many books around on AI and learning yet. There will be. That's why I think the blogosphere is interesting. You know, in other words, who is actively doing stuff here? And then 
you know, I, I write a lot in this, but I and I, I like to write not on pure AI, but AI as related to learning theory, mm -hmm. as you know. So keep an eye on the bloggers uh, and also the companies that are coming through. You know, in LXP, these companies are quite generous in terms of the content they've produced in white papers. So on Learning Pool, for example, they have some really excellent, quite objective, written by people outside the company, papers on learning experience design, how LXP sentiment analysis. They even have a free maturity model and data, which you can just go on to Learning Pool, both do it straight off. So I think search out the companies who are leading edge, filtered, uh, a new one in Sweden called Sana Labs. Uh, who have a personalized assistant uh, on, on them. So I think there are a number of companies who are doing good things in this area as well, and they tend to be quite generous with their, with their knowledge, I feel. Thank you. I will put uh, in the show notes uh, some links to learning yeah. to your blog in particular thank you. and to your wildfire site. Yeah. Um, but uh, so thank you so much for doing this video and uh, for writing the books and doing all the sharing that you have done your first series of 50 learning theorists and then went, went to 100 fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. No, no problem, Guy. No, you know, this, we're the LD world, you know, we're, if we, if we don't share this stuff, I mean, we're in that profession. That's our job. You yeah. know, we create stuff. We're meant to get stuff out to people. Uh, this not invented here or holding on to knowledge is bizarre in our profession, you know, and, uh, we have this, mar I mean, we're sitting on other on the opposite sides of the planet doing this right now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy when you put your mind to it, isn't it? You're a sharer, you make these videos, that's a great service to everyone. Uh, but if we all have this attitude, then things will uh, improve much faster. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very thankful for my early mentors through my 40 year career. People openly shared, gruff people openly yeah. shared yeah, after yeah, the yeah. roughness, right? So you yeah. can't be afraid to ask. You need to reach out and people will generally help you if you ask. And if you That's correct. Yeah, I wholly agree. I wholly agree with that. We tend to forget that we've had 50, you know, we've been, the, 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 none of this grew out in nothing, you know. Oh, I've been talking about workflow learning, but, you know, we've had this conversation before. But, you know, you can't you can go back to people, I can't remember, it's Gilbert. Yeah, the Gilbert Human Competencies book. And then we have Gloria Gary in 1991 publishes a book on performance support. We had jo uh, 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 Cross, uh, Jay Cross, who's a good friend of mine, who used to go talk about this endlessly at conferences. He used the term in the workflow. And yet we think that Deloitte or something came up with it last week. You know, it's, yeah. it, it, it's bizarre. There's lots of good knowledge that's there in the heads of people who've been around for a while, and they tend to be the people like you who share. So that's that's a good thing. Well, yeah, I agree that uh, there's so much. You know, what, what what's uh, what's old is new again. It seems. And yeah. Okay. What's what's evolved? What's changed drastically is the technology, but the basic things, the basic concepts and approaches. Uh, there's a lot of validity in those things. They just need to be adapted to the youth taking advantage of this new technology. And I, and uh, I, but, but I'm singing that old song here that because uh, I, I, I learned so much from these, the old masters and yet, and it's okay if people change the language on it, but they need to have an appreciation because there were a lot of lessons learned. There were a lot of successes and even more yeah. failures. Yes. We're not yes. cognizant of that past history we too will go into the ditch with some of the, and we could have been informed and avoided uh, yeah. uh, issues, but. Uh, my, my great example of that is space practice. So space practice as a theory was outlined in 1885 by Ebbinghaus, mm -hmm. 1885, 130 years ago. And we're still not, and yet it's, it's been, the replicated studies are good. We know it works and hardly anybody does it even now. <laughs> and it's not bizarre. It's 1885. We could, we've almost willfully ignored it for 130 years. But to be fair, we now have the technology that makes it possible. So yeah. up pops Duolingo. Duolingo is worth $1.5 billion. And that's because it uses space practice. Mm -hmm. And yet the guy who came up with it, 1885. So that's what we need to do. Forget about the date. Is it good theory or not? Is it? Does the science tell us it works? Exactly. Okay, Donald, thank you so much. Uh, Donald Clark of Plan B, because it's not Plan A. And, uh, I hope people uh, uh, follow up with you on your blog and uh, take a good look at this book because I think it's really uh, uh, insightful and uh, shows the promise of what uh, 
is soon coming our collective way. But again, thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Guy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.